Greetings, everyone. Hi there. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Carlene Spry. I am the awards administrator for the Golden Crown Literary Awards, and I want to welcome you to the first ever Goldie finalist spotlight series. So yay team. Uh, for those of you who are new to the Golden Crown Literary Society, uh, the GCLS recognizes and rewards quality literary works about women who love women. We also provide learning opportunities, encouragement, and assistance to new and established writers. Uh, if you haven't heard, we have a highly respected writing academy. We do have an annual gathering of hundreds of readers, writers, publishers, and editors. That is our annual conference that is coming up in July. We also have a monthly GCLS members only online book club. So we invite you to learn more about the GCLS and perhaps even become a member. Uh, and you could do that by visiting our website at goldencrown.org. Uh, now, just a few quick housekeeping items. We will have some time at the end of the session for some Q&A. Um, so please be sure to use the Zoom Q&A box to submit a question. We will answer as many as we possibly can for you. Uh, and if you run into any technical issues today, please log off and then log back in. And that is usually going to resolve uh, most of the issues. Um, now that does it for announcements. So Flashpoint Publications is our fabulous sponsor today um, and they have prepared us a video. So let's go ahead and listen to their video. This is our sponsor. At Flashpoint Publications, it is our mission to bring LGBTQIA stories to life. In support of the growing multiracial and multi-age coalition of those who demand unbiased treatment and inclusion in all pursuits, we welcome you into our house. We support diversity within our works and welcome novels penned by and for all people. Flashpoint is a proud member of GCLS, and we wish to congratulate all the finalists, including our own authors, Tammy Bird and Kay Aiton. We hope to see everyone in person next year. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to introduce our authors here today. So we're going to start today with Lucy Bexley, who will be reading from Must Love Silence, which is a finalist in contemporary romance short novels uh, and debut. Uh, next is Bryce Oakley, who is reading um, from final, a finalist in new adult fiction, The Adventurers. Then we'll hear from Lucy Dreamer, who is reading a selection from Heart of Gold, which is a finalist in historical fiction. Barbara Ann Wright will read from her science fiction fantasy shortlisted novel, Lady of Stone. And we'll close out the reading portion of our session with Kate Hazel Hall reading from her shortlisted debut novel, From Darkness. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. So let's go ahead and kick the sucker off. And Lucy Bexley, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody, for attending today. Um, so, hi, I'm Lucy Bexley. I'm thrilled to be reading this excerpt of my debut indie novel, Most Love Silence. Uh, this is a story about Reese, an introvert who rarely goes out and narrates audiobooks from her Chicago apartment. She's hired to narrate Arden Abbott's latest book and has to travel to New York where Arden is overseeing the narration herself. After a personal issue derailed her career, Arden is focused on a perfect comeback and is not willing to take any risks when it comes to reaching that goal. In the scene from chapter two, Reese is auditioning for Arden by reading a scene from her book in front of her. This is their first meeting. So should I just get right into this, Reese asked? No preamble to discuss the job? Let's see if those details are necessary after the audition. Of course, you wanna make sure I can read first, Reese said. She sent a smile across the table that she hoped fell somewhere between self-deprecating and endearing. From the stern look on Arden's face, she gathered it was neither. Reese began reading. I threw Sarah on the bed and pushed her knees apart roughly. That was part of our game, the roughness. So was my impatience as I tore at her clothes, leaving a slight snag of desire on the skirt I pulled from her body and tossed over my shoulder. It made a soft snapping sound like a flag in the wind as it fell to the floor. There was something charged and crackling in the air. 
When she read, Arden's eyes locked on her, and things felt a lot less like fiction and a lot more like foreplay. Care to continue? Arden asked smoothly. Reese nodded. She was very fucked, or very not fucked, whichever the bad one turned out to be in this scenario. Arden continued to stare at her in all her beautiful, cold glory, and Reese felt like the aforementioned skirt, about to be ripped apart and thrown to the floor. It should be unnerving, but with the scene she was reading, it had blurred into something strangely erotic. Reese felt electric with the tension in the room. When she touched the table to flip the page, she expected a shock, but all she got was the light sting of a paper cut. Of course, Reese said, I just usually start with an earlier scene. This scene is from chapter two. Ah, Reese said, trying to keep her face blank, even as she could feel her heart beating in her chest. On your knees. Sarah complied, flipping over with the skill of an Olympic gymnast doing a floor routine. Desire shot through me, and I knew I'd need to focus to hold out. Tonight wasn't about me. It was about Sarah and unwinding her bit by bit, about bending her to my will as I bent to hers. I, the way you're saying Sarah isn't right. Reese felt hazy as she looked up from the page to find Arden's gaze boring into her. She felt the powerful urgency in the scene, in every part of her. She felt on top and ready to top. Was this elaborate professional foreplay? Or was this a totally normal audition and she just needed to get out more? Arden's face gave nothing away. It had been a very long week and it was only Tuesday. The sooner she could finish this reading and get out of here, the better. Sorry, what did you say? Arden sighed. You're leaving off the H in Sarah. That's not how I imagined it being said. What do you mean imagine? It's a common name. More emphasis on the H. The last syllable is Ra, Arden said with a neutral expression, as though she wasn't being completely absurd. This was a test or some weird power play. Had this woman never heard anyone say the name Sarah before? Reese tried to remember all the reasons she should still want this job. Number one, her life would implode without this money. She took a deep breath. And even though it went against everything she believed as a professional narrator, she readied herself to mispronounce Sarah, one of the most classic names in history, for the remainder of the meeting. There was apparently no pride she wasn't willing to let go of to get this job, and she wasn't sure she liked this new information about herself. Reese started the scene over. God, this was weird. She'd never been watched by an author while reading an intimate scene they'd written. Reading sex scenes felt like a private act, which was counterintuitive because she did read them for other people to listen to. Usually, if she got turned on, it was in the privacy of her own home. But this felt like phone sex through a tin can and a string, an uncomfortable proximity, or fucking someone while reciting their poems. Way too intimate with a glinting edge of narcissism. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. I am the applause for the entire audience, <laughs> uh, who unfortunately you wouldn't be able to hear, but yay. Okay, let's uh, go on to our next reader then. Thank you very much, Lucy. Bryce, you have the floor. Hi, I'm Bryce Oakley and I'm an indie author. The Adventurers is about two new friends, Kendall and Joey, who decide to get out of their comfort zones by making an adventure jar, where they put slips of paper with things they've always wanted to try. This scene is an earlier adventure from Joey's point of view, and I do want to warn you, it contains profanities and the word dildo like seven times. Why the hell had she written down buy a sex toy in a shop? Kendall grinned. It's going to be fine. This is a female owned sex shop, so it's not skeezy. No edible panties in here, I think. Joey nodded. I'm not nervous at all, she lied, stuffing her clammy hands in her pockets. Bells jingled over the door as they entered, and she took a deep cleansing breath through her nose, expecting the worst. Okay, so it wasn't quite the sticky den of perversion she had been envisioning. A blue-haired woman stood at the counter and greeted them. Joey let her shoulders relax, stepping around a few tables piled with books, trinkets, and smooth crystal wands 
the latter of which made her wonder where those went exactly. She noted an entire table covered in dildos of all shapes and sizes, set up as a tiny army of silicone soldiers. She walked towards a bookshelf lined with items on display, plants, and surprisingly, tons of vibrators. They were so damn pretty for being vibrators though, like minute, pleasurable works of art. Joey grabbed a box off the shelf. It was a small metal piece without much information on the package. Butt plugs? Kendall raised her eyebrows. What? No. Joey quickly put the box back down. Don't knock until you try it, Kendall winked. Joey's mouth dropped open slightly. Wow, Kendall contained multitudes. Kendall cleared her throat. Okay, so the whole fun part of coming to the shop is to see the size of things, maybe even test whatever they have open, and get a feel for what works for you. You can test them? Joey looked suspiciously at all the merchandise on the walls. She was overcome with the urge to wash her hands and run. Kendall laughed, shaking her head. No, you test them by turning them on and holding them in your hand, not like using them. Joey took a step away from the shelving unit, just me on the safe side. Kendall reached for a vibrator out of the box. It had a gold inlay and a beautiful sleek look. She turned it on and handed it to Joey. Now, see how this one is more rumbly than buzzy? Hold it on the fleshy part of your palm. The way Kendall was standing so close, talking quietly, Joy wondered briefly if the palm was an erogenous zone. You doing okay? Doing great, Joey said, nodding quickly. The confidence Kendall had about sex and toys made Joey feel a little curious. Sure, curious was the word for that. Not intensely turned on or anything, simply appreciative of her knowledge. Yeah, appreciative. She flipped over the vibrator in her hand to check the price. $200. Holy shit. That was like a car payment. She couldn't justify that. She set it back down on the shelf, shoving her hands back in her pockets. Would it be weird if I bought this for you? Kendall asked, taking the box from the shelf, turning it over in her hands, and also apparently reading her mind. Like as an adventure gift or as a please stop using a bullet gift. No way. I just refuse to let you not have mind-blowing orgasms anymore, Kendall said. And was Joey just imagining it, or was Kendall making intense eye contact with her? Had she taken a step closer? Joey's stomach flipped again and she cleared her throat. She licked her lips and Kendall's eyes slipped down to her mouth. Was it all in her head or was there the chance that Kendall returned her feelings? No, she couldn't possibly, right? Kendall's features relaxed as she turned away. Right. Kendall glanced down at her phone, swiping the screen with her thumb. Hey, are you free tonight? Like all night? Joey inhaled quickly, which caused her to choke, which kicked off an entire coughing fit. She took a step backward to avoid coughing in Kendall's face, bumping right into the table with the dildo display. The next part happened in slow motion. The table teetered under the sudden force of her hips as she lost her balance, falling in a pile of limbs onto the floor. She managed to roll away from the table as it fell, but she did not avoid the dozen or so dildos that launched sideways off of the surface to pelt her like rubbery fun-sized torpedoes. The icing on the cake was the massive rainbow monstrosity that smacked her right in the face. Are you okay? Joey squeezed her eyes shut and considered pretending to be dead, just in case that might make Kendall leave her alone to wallow in self-pity for the rest of her life. Or maybe she'd get amnesia from hitting her head. Maybe it would all be a terrible nightmare and she'd wake up having not just been smacked across the face with a rainbow dildo the size of her forearm. Instead, she opened her eyes to find Kendall inches from her face, staring at her with a panicked expression. Anything hurt? Just my pride, Joey said. She sat all the way up and looked down at her lap where a giant blue dildo still lay. Did I um, break any of them? Am I gonna have to buy like 20 dildos right now? Kendall began to laugh, pointing a neon pink dildo at her. You were attacked, she said. I'd say that leaves you innocent. Joey held up the veiny blue toy as it jiggled in her hands. I think that's enough adventure for me. This was why she bought things online. Nothing bad had ever happened to her in a virtual sex toy shop. Yay! Oh, 
my goodness. Dildo avalanche. Okay. <laughs> we'll come back to that. So let's now uh, hear from our next uh, reader. And this is going to be Lucy Dreamer. Hi, my name is Lucy Dreamer. And I'll be reading an excerpt from my book, Heart of Gold. It's set during the Klondike Gold Rush and follows the lives of Thomas, who has decided to live her life as a man after her father tries to marry her off, and Rachel, who along with her husband Roy are looking for adventure. But when tragedy strikes and Rachel finds herself alone and pregnant at the top of the world, Thomas, who has already lost her heart to Rachel on the journey there, steps in to help. And all is fine until Rachel's sister Charlotte discovers Thomas a secret. It devastates Rachel, who had been falling for the man with the heart of gold. Now she must try to reconcile the man she knew with the woman she now knows him to be. The scene I'm going to read is from chapter 21, when Rachel brings Thomas in from the mine for a bath, a meal, a haircut, and some answers. Thomas closed her eyes as Rachel's blunt nails scratched lightly from her temple to the nape of her neck. Was it hard when you first started living as a man? Thomas's throat worked to swallow so she could answer. Rachel's gentle ministrations were as stirring as they were relaxing. After a month or so, I found it easier than not. I was always tall for a woman, had a good chin on me. The voice took some time. As for learning mannerisms, I watched and learned in saloons, gambling halls, and brothels. There was a long pause before Rachel asked, did you ever visit upstairs? Thomas could feel the tips of her ears grow hot. Oh no, I've never. Rachel stopped cutting for a moment. So how do you know you prefer the company of women over men? Before she could stop herself, Thomas turned the question on to Rachel. Well, how do you know you prefer the company of men over women? I, Rachel started, but then stopped. She put the scissors on the table and sat down on the end of the bed in front of Thomas. She looked down and studied the comb in her hand. I, I guess I don't really know if I do. Thomas felt her pulse race. Was that what the meal, the haircut, the bath was all about? Rachel trying to figure it out? Thomas worked to temper her hope. Well, to answer your question, I had a best friend. I thought she hung the moon and the stars. I had feelings for her. I didn't have a name for it, but I knew it was very wrong, so I kept to myself. She got married on her 16th birthday and moved away. It was the worst pain I'd ever experienced until recently. She gave Rachel a small, poignant smile, and she saw nothing but sympathy in her eyes. She looked down, wondering when they'd join hands. It emboldened her. I hadn't experienced those feelings again until I met you. The moment I saw you, I think I knew I was in trouble. Her smile faded and she took in a breath and let it out slow. After Roy died and I offered to be a husband to you, a father to your unborn child, my heart was already yours, but I had this secret. She could feel her eyes prick with tears and she blinked hard to keep them at bay. I'm sorry if you felt I purposely deceived you. Please believe me when I tell you that was not my intention at all. I simply fell in love with you and selfishly, I didn't want to lose you. There was a long moment of quiet as both women sat there, Rachel still with a loose grip on Thomas's hand. Thomas didn't expect Rachel to fall into her arms or declare her love, but the look in her eyes did give her reason to finally hope. Finally, Rachel gave Thomas a small yet genuine smile and squeezed her hand. I believe you, Thomas. Thomas sighed in relief. She felt like she was in a dream. Rachel slowly stood, giving Thomas's hand another squeeze before letting go. I better finish or you're going to look awfully silly. Thomas felt Rachel's swollen belly brush up against her arm as she started cutting again. Suddenly something pushed hard against her shoulder and she gasped and turned to look at Rachel's stomach. Rachel giggled and reached for Thomas's hand. Her eyes widened when Rachel put it right against her belly. 
Again, she felt something press on her hand and she let out a sharp bark of surprised and delighted laughter. Whoa. She looked up to see Rachel's eyes shining with tears. Does it hurt? Thomas stood to give Rachel her chair. Rachel smiled and put her hand on Thomas's arm. Not at all, Thomas. I think he's saying hello to you. Keep your hand on, feel. Thomas moved her fingers around slowly and gently, actually feeling this life, this little baby growing inside Rachel only made her fall more deeply in love. Yay, another excellent reading. This is just going so well, guys, yay. Okay, so now let's hear from Barbara Ann Wright. Hi everybody. Um, I'll be reading from Lady of Stone today. Um, my it's a fantasy romance. Um, my magic users in it are called Pyridistes, and they use these little pyramids to wield their magic. So hopefully you won't be too lost after you hear that. Fauna hated everything about this tea party, but she wasn't supposed to show it. Prince Gunnar had instructed her to smile and make cheerful conversation. She had promised to try not to scowl. By the look she was getting, she was failing at that. She would much rather be sequestered in her room with a good book. She trailed Prince Gunner for a little bit, but he was in his element, surrounded by attractive, fawning minions dressed in the latest fashion. Fauna wondered how often they had to practice to keep the large feathers in their hats from knocking into one another. Maybe they'd get tangled up and go down in a heap. She'd have to practice not laughing her head off. She let them get ahead of her and tried to enjoy the garden. Gunner didn't really need protecting. He was just trying to get her out into nature and sunlight and around people. Three things she detested, that, but, but that he felt necessary for a person's well-being. She turned down a lonely path and a flash ahead caught her eye. She paused, frowning before stepping forward, thinking of pyramid crystal, but it was only some ornamentation on a noble's sleeve. This noble wore no hat, and the sun caught her pale curls, a shade blonder than the prince's, almost white. She turned and Donna's mouth went dry at the sight of her tanned skin, round cheeks and wide, mint green eyes. Her full lips turned down in a frown or a pout, and she sighed as if infinitely sad. Donna shook her head. The last thing she needed was to develop a crush with some stuck up, albeit beautiful, melancholic noble. She began to turn away when the noble woman stiffened as if given a vision of her own grave. Donna looked for the source of her alarm, but saw nothing. When the noble woman began to shake, Donna stepped forward to ask if she was all right, but the woman fell to her knees and the ground let out an alarming rumble. Donna grabbed hold of a tree, her mind whirling, but before she could even guess what was happening, the wall behind the noble woman bucked like a runaway horse the stone shifting and melting together before lurching toward the noble woman like a wave, threatening to bury her. Fauna ran, her heart pounding. She hit the noble woman and heaved, carrying both of them out of the way before the stone crashed down. Fauna rolled away from a spray of dirt and reached into her pocket for one of her pyramids. It was only half the size of her, of her fist, but it blazed with enough light for ten of its kind. The five sides shifted like the wall had done, distorting the smooth crystal. Donna dropped it with a hiss, mystified about what was happening. She pulled another, a mild explosive pyramid that might weaken the foundation of the wall, which was currently lifting again as if for another strike. Desperate, she chucked the pyramid, trying to ignore her panic. The tinkle of breaking crystal disappeared in a roaring explosion. Donna gasped as the force of it hit her in the chest, knocking her down before shock had a chance to do so. Stone flew apart in hunks, showering everything in sharp little strikes. Fauna winced, wiping the dust from her eyes. Since when could she make a blast like that? She never crafted such a powerful pyramid in her life. She couldn't help but jot a pride. Then the noble woman moaned, and through a haze of dust, the wall began to rise again, smaller bits rolling back to join the hole. Fauna's pride disappeared in worry. Now what? She patted her pockets, but she'd only brought two pyramids but her first had come through the explosion intact. It was still writhing in the grass. Donna pushed to her feet and lurched toward it, not knowing what else to do but eliminate whatever strangeness she could find. With a prayer to the spirits that this one would not explode, she smashed the pyramid under her boot. After a horrid grinding sound, the wall collapsed. 
Donna took a moment to breathe, a thousand questions hurtling through her mind. She listened for more commotion, but heard nothing. The noble one coughed and blinked, head lifting, her pretty features contorted in pain and fear. Please, she said, her voice hoarse. They can't know it was me, please. Donna hesitated, but voices echoed from the garden in all directions. They'd be coming to find the source of the blast. You don't know what they'll do to me, the noble woman said. What else had, whatever else had happened, her fear was real, and Donna knew what it was like to have one's power be misunderstood. She rushed to the noble woman and hauled her upright. Rumors circulated about areas of Faraday where Pyridistes were still shamed or even worse. She didn't have time to ask. She hauled the noble woman into a clump of bushes and lowered her to the ground. Regain your strength, she said, then sneak away. Thank you, the noble woman's grip tightened on Thana's sleeve. Thank you. Thana fought embarrassment, but her cheeks still burned. Prince Gunner would have known what to say to make the noble woman swoon, but Thana could only mumble, you're welcome, before she returned to the shattered wall. <laughs> well done, well done. Thank you. Okay, and our final reader of the day, Kate. Hazel Hall. Hi everyone, thank you for having me and thanks so much to the GCLS for this opportunity to read from my debut YA novel From Darkness, which was published last year by Duet Books. So Ari and Alex are childhood friends separated by death and reunited by or maybe in spite of fate. And in the scene I'm about to read, the girls share a tender moment at the edge of the Southern Ocean, where the novel is set. Ari and Alex brushed down the horses and fed them, and then they walked in silence along the track to Seal Cove. The tide was out and the reef lay exposed like an invitation. The southerly was blowing in now, great gusts of wind whipped across the water. The wind was chilly, but Ari's skin had absorbed all the heat of the day, and so the wind's cold fingers were deliciously welcome. Past the sharp rocks, Alex dipped her cupped hands into a deep rock pool and splashed her face with seawater. Ari gave herself another mental scolding for having impure thoughts as she watched Alex lick the salt from her lips. But Ari's body wasn't listening. It's no use, she thought. I can't help how I feel. Even if she doesn't feel the same way, if nothing ever happens between us, I will still feel like this. I think I'm falling in love with her. They picked their way across the reef to the flat rock where seven years ago, they had dived into this perilous stretch of water. Alex reached for her hand. Ari looked up at her standing tall against the stormy ocean with her dark hair blowing wildly around her face. Alex stared at the channel, at the heave and fall of the swell and she bit her lower lip slightly. Ari hung her head. She pulled her hand free and wrapped her arms around her shoulders. She struggled to find the words to tell Alex what her loss had meant to her. She couldn't find the words to tell her that, even though she'd been patched up and patched up fairly well, Alex's absence from her life had made a wound inside her that nobody could ever heal. She wanted to tell Alex how she had kept it together day by day for Cass, even though she just wanted to follow Alex. And she wanted to say, most of all, how sorry she was for making her swim to Danger Island on that day seven years ago. But Ari suddenly felt awkward beside this tall, impossibly good-looking Alex. At Wyndham, doing the washing up or reading in the hammock or brushing Rusty, Alex seemed enough like her old self that it was easy, or easier, to forget where she'd been, what she now was. But here, where the land fell away into the sea, Alex was stronger, more powerful, and more remote. Ari thought she could detect, faintly, a flicker of that unearthly shimmer that had surrounded Alex when she first confronted her on the track. Ari thought wretchedly of the life that should have been Alex's, of family and friends and sunny days and boring schoolwork and the simple little joys of being alive in the world. She looked across the deep blue of the channel to where Danger Island stood, cold and aloof, amid the swirling ocean. She began to cry silently. Tears ran down her cheeks and dripped onto her crossed arms. I'm sorry, she murmured. Alex, I'm so sorry. It was all my fault, my idea. 
Alex put her arms around her and stroked her hair. No, Ari. It was, she sobbed. It was my fault. If I hadn't made you do the swim that day, if I'd been more sensible about the tide, it would never have happened. Alex held her tight. Then she wiped the tears off Ari's cheeks and tucked her windblown hair behind her ears. Oh God, Ari, is that what you think? Is that what you've been thinking all these years? Ari nodded, trying to blink away the tears that wouldn't stop. Alex looked serious as she took Ari's face gently in her hands. Look at me, Ari. It wasn't your fault. I'm older than you, remember? I could have said no. I could have refused to do it. I chose to swim to the rock that day. I wanted to. It wasn't your fault. Alex gently pressed Ari's head against her shoulder. Ari's sobs grew more uncontrollable. She thought bitterly that this was typical of her life. Here was Alex holding her properly at last, and all she could do was cry like a baby. But these tears came from a grief that was so deep, so measureless, that it didn't seem possible she would ever run out of them. Alex spoke softly as she let her cry. Ari, listen, I haven't told you all that much about the afterlife, and there are good reasons for that, but I can tell you this. We don't go before our time. That may seem cruel when it's children who die and not old people or sick people, but there is a little thread that is our life and when it is being measured and cut, that's it. There's no point fighting against it and there's absolutely no way my drowning that day was your fault. It was my time, that's all. One of those silken threads in Atropos's basket, that was mine and whoever summoned me must have picked it and found me in the ocean. But that's so unfair. Ari protested, speaking into Alex's bare shoulder. I never said it was fair, she replied mildly. Thank you. Yay, nicely done. Okay, let's have all the authors come back on. Turn your cameras back on so we could see your happy faces. Look at those great people. Okay, now here comes the scary part. Ah, okay. So great job, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for those readings. Those were so, so good. And uh, audience members, everybody, you notice that in the chat, I've been putting in the links to purchase these books. Please take advantage of that. Support these authors who are doing the hard work of writing these great stories for us. So please click on those links. I noticed a couple of you actually already did. So good on you. So again, if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A. We'll get to as many as we can. And I'm going to start things off with some questions of my own. And I'm going to start things off with uh, Barbara. So Barbara Ann Wright, tell me, um, what was your inspiration for this book? Where did the idea come from? Uh, well, it's actually a prequel to my uh, Pyrrhides Day adventures that began with the Pyramid Waltz. And I knew I had these characters in mind while I was writing that, but this is the only time I could get back to them. Um, so that, that's pretty much just like, it's an untold story that I wanted to tell that stood by itself. Okay, great. Lucy Dreamer. Lucy D, how about you? Where did the idea come from for this book? Uh, well, I was actually reading uh, with my son, uh, Call of the Wild, and just, you know, kind of got interested in, you know, Klondike Gold Rush, and uh, it actually, my book started out as a fan fiction, uh, a way hot fan fiction, and so I used, kind of plugged those characters in, and, uh, and yeah, it was lots and lots of research, which was a lot of fun as well. Okay, excellent. Yeah, fan fiction seems to be the start for so many of the best books that we have in, in, in this field. So yay team. Um, Kate, how about you? Where did, where did the idea for, for this novel come from? I think I've always been interested in like afterlife and underworld mythology. And one day I was lucky enough to be down in that part of the world where the novel is set. And I just had this idea about these two girls who lose each other when they're kids and then find each other later on. And then of course they have to save the world and each other from the powers of darkness. It really was that simple. Okay, okay, great. Bryce? 
Um, there's a line in a poem by Frank O'Hara, um, and the the name of the poem uh, eludes me right now. Meditations in an emergency, something like that. But the line is. Um, each time my heart is broken, um, I feel more adventurous. And so I had the idea of um, a woman going through a heartbreak and how that could change her life positively. Okay, excellent. And um, Lucy B, how about you? Yeah, so I had like this um, first line for a story pop into my head one day and I didn't end up using it in, in the actual book, but the line was, um, Reese was on a glorious streak. She hadn't left her apartment in 278 days. And so I really wanted to write about a character that was an introvert. And then I was basically was just thinking about like, you know, what would that person's life look like? And that's how the story started. Okay. Okay. And after the 15, the last 15 months, <laughs> we, exactly. all, we all could kind of relate to that and haven't left the house. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Excellent. Excellent. So, um, uh, I'm going to go back now um, to Lucy Dreamer for my next question. Um, and my next question is, what was your favorite game as a child? Hmm. I didn't play a lot of game games, but I loved uh, playing G.I. Joe's with my, yeah, my male cousins had them and they would give me their hand-me-downs. And uh, they would usually go kidnap my sister's Barbies and, you know, I'd bury them for fun. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Seems like a good thing to do with Barbies sometimes. All right. Great. Um, <laughs> Kate, how about you? As a kid, what was your uh, favorite game? It could be board game, outside game, made up game, whatever you want. I grew up in the country and I also read a lot of fantasy fiction so my favorite game was dressing up and making swords and um conning anybody who happened to come to visit into also dressing up and then we would go and fight dragons and have adventures excellent i like that i like that uh bryce how about you um i really loved this board game called dream phone where you call like bachelors um yeah, yeah, I've always been really into romance, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. And what's your cat's name? This is Cowboy. She co-authored the book. <laughs> well, she's delightful. <laughs> she thinks she is. Um, <laughs> Barbara Ann, how about you? What, what, what's your favorite game as a kid? Uh, I also grew up in the country. Um, I didn't have a lot of dress-up stuff, but we did have a, an old tractor that just sat on the property. And that tractor was a lot of things. It was a horse. It was a ship. It was a spaceship. It was a. It it did a lot of uh, double duty. All right, all-purpose tractor. I like yes. it. I like it. Lucy B. Yeah. So I think my favorite game as a kid was um, hide and seek. So I have a bunch of sisters. Um, so it was a fun game for us all to play. And also I'm very small and I'm good at like being very quiet. So I usually won. <laughs> I like games that I won. So. Yeah, yeah, that 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 makes sense to me. Yeah, if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna play a game, be good at it and win, right? Um, now if uh, I'm gonna put you on the you all on the spot now, if your book had a theme song, what what song do you think represents? your book and i'm gonna i'm gonna open this up i'm gonna start with whoever speaks up first so whoever unmutes and speaks up first it's all yours i'd say like airplane white noise why um so the main character reese is very introverted and she also just needs like a lot of quiet time to herself and so white noise is like one of the things she sorts of she'll like put on her headphones to like center herself okay all right great who else because I will start calling your name. Yeah, go ahead, Lucy. Um, not not necessarily a, a theme song. Um, I had a soundtrack that I would write to um, okay. by an artist message to bears and just basically a bunch of those songs are instrumental, quite cinematic, uh, but pretty much anything from, from there. Kind of had that epic feel to it. 
Yeah, yeah, and each one had a had a bit of a you know a mood that would fit whatever scene I was writing. Okay, all right. I think mine uh, mine would be we're not going to take it anymore. Who is that by Twisted Sister? I think one of those. Yes, because mm -hmm. it's about a uh, uh, these period East days finally deciding that they don't want to take any of these nobles crap anymore. Okay, excellent, excellent. K Kate, you unmuted. Are you ready? <laughs> Mine is, and I also had a, a playlist, um, and this was sort of top of the um, Private Universe by Crowded House. Anyone know that song? Yeah. Well, I'm not familiar with it, but it's it's a song I think about about lovers or or two people who just you know when you're in love the the whole world contracts and it's just you and that other person. So that was that was the theme song. Um, but also high on the playlist was A Forest by The Cure, because a lot of the spooky stuff in the novel takes place in a pine plantation. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, and who haven't we heard from yet? Bryce? Um, as as soon as you asked an on-the-spot question, I can't think of a single song I've ever heard in my life, but <laughs> um, I know it would be by Taylor Swift. Okay. Why? What about a more adventurous by Rilo? I mean, yeah, that's like a classic choice. Uh, it's it's about the same poem, so yeah, yeah. more adventurous, Rilo Kiley. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. Okay. okay. Um, we do have a question in the Q and A for Lucy D. Um, the research for your book was it straight up Google, uh, or did you read the actual historical tomes? Or did you just make shit up that sounded believable? <laughs> no judgment. <laughs> uh, a combination of all three. I mean, I listened to quite a few audiobooks um, on women in the Klondike. I actually did read uh, a firsthand account of, uh, like, you know, can't remember the name of it, uh, but a man who went up and, you know, lost everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, documentaries I read you know like the packing list I went into you know search that what exactly what they packed they had to pack a year's worth of supplies or they couldn't be admitted so you know a ton of research let's just put it that way okay a ton of research with a little bit of baking shit up as you go you know it was a little bit <laughs> a I little tried bit. it you know what and people still nailed me I mean I had somebody nail me for putting bar stools at a bar in a saloon in the 1890s so you know i try to get it right but never. <laughs> you know th <laughs> things happen right things happen right. it is what it is exactly. um, <laughs> um so i guess my next question for you guys is okay great look at you guys you're goldie finalist woo woo what now what's what's next on the horizon for you what do you have in the hopper uh, Barbara Ann, let's start with you. Uh, pretty much just to retire. I mean, this is the top of the mountain, right? So <laughs> you're pretty much just done. Uh, no, I just started a new series um, that began with The Noble and the Nightingale. So I'm busy working on the other two books in the series. Okay. When, when can we expect the next release from you? Um, well, The Noble and the Nightingale just came out in March. So I imagine the the the, uh, the next book won't either be out till very late in the year or early next year. Okay, all right. Uh, Kate, how about you? Do you have plans for your next book? I am writing a dystopian thriller, and it's about a girl called Mouse who escapes from a xenotransplant lab into a world where xenotransplantation has become the norm. And it's a world that makes no sense. She goes looking for her mother. So at the moment, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's YA, upper YA, really what it is, but I'll put it together in the one hour of time I have to write every morning between 5 and 6 a.m. And we'll see what happens. So you like the light, kind of frivolous topics that just... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just just something, something light for, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Um, Bryce, how about you? What do you have in the hopper? Um, I actually just released a book on the 14th. It's called Nevermind. Um, nice. Now I'm working on 
um, a romance set in 2003 um, about a woman who comes home again. <laughs> and that's all you're going to say about it. <laughs> um, and what's really frightening is we're getting to a point where 2003 is almost considered historical. Isn't that scary? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the fashion alone, I feel like maybe could die out, but. Mm, yeah, potentially, <laughs> potentially. Um, uh, Lucy Dreamer, have we talked to you about this one? Not yet. Okay. What's what about um, for you? Yeah, I'm working on a book uh, about a bisexual hot mess FBI agent and a sweet butch uh, pediatrician. It's going to be kind of like a suspense crime romance situation. Okay. About 40,000 words into it. So, okay. I'm great. Here. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And Lucy B, how about you? Yeah, so I'm working on a novel right now. It's a rom-com, um, sort of like a, I guess like an age gap workplace romance and um, it's featuring Elsie, who's like a puppeteer on the children's show, sort of like the Muppets and Jones, who comes in to sort of take over the, the media company. Okay, excellent. I love the name Elsie. I don't know why. I just love the name Elsie. I love it too. Um, Bryce, we have a question here for you. It's basically the same question, um, <laughs> sort of. Did you draw on your personal experience, <laughs> personal knowledge of dildos for that scene, or did you do research? <laughs> um, my mother is watching this webinar, um, <laughs> so I'm going to say just research. Okay. Um, yep. Okay. Way to go, audience. Getting our authors in trouble with their moms. Well done. <laughs> and hi, mom. Thank you so much for coming to see your daughter. Um, excellent. Again, guys, if you've got more questions, throw them in there. We'll, we'll, as you can see, our authors are, are very happy to answer them, even if it does seem a little embarrassing. I have a question. Oh, go for it. I have a question for Lucy B. Your voice is amazing. Have you ever done like audio work or would you ever consider doing it? Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I've never done it. I, I definitely would consider doing it. It seems like a, a huge like time investment, um, but I definitely, I love reading, so. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Lucy kind of has that, that kind of voice that you just kind of go, oh, yeah, go ahead, read to me. <laughs> that's cool. That's good. Thank it's, you. Thank it's all you. good. Yeah, so that's, that's very nice. Um, quite frankly, a lot better than some of the professional audiobook readers that are out there that I've listened <laughs> to. So, you know, good on you. Good on ya. Thank you. Um, do, 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 do. Bryce, I'm going to come to you for this next question. Roller skates or roller blades? Um, I used to be uh, strictly roller blades as a child, but uh, I have embraced roller blades as of late because they are easier to balance on. Okay, okay. And how do you feel about skateboards? Negatively. <laughs> Bad experience or just no, no desire? Um, so I grew up like as a teenage emo kid and I just like desperately wanted to skateboard and appear very cool. Um, and that was not in the cards for me. So negatively. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Barbara Ann, how about you? Roller skates, roller blades, which, which is your choice? I am famously clumsy. Um, so I learned how to skate as a child only by forcing myself to do it until my knees were bloody and then I could finally stay on my feet. And so now I don't even risk it. So neither, no way. <laughs> <laughs> and any, any, um, strong feelings about skateboards? No, really. I'd have to be strapped to one in order to do anything with it. <laughs> okay. That could be something fun to do at the next GCLS conference. So <laughs> be prepared. We'll sell tickets. It'll be a fundraiser. Uh, Kate, how about you? Roller skates or roller blades? What's your what's your your poison? Skate. Hey, I've never tried blades. I think I yeah. I think I'd fall over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and do you, how do you feel about skateboards? I've taken off 
a lot of bark on a skateboard and it it took months to heal that was my one and only time that I tried so I've never never got back on and I and I must say that wasn't all that long ago which is embarrassing okay okay hey you know no judgment I think it's cool I think it's cool Lucy skates or blades uh Lucy Dreamer uh roller skates all day I I used to um used to go to the roller rink and I would always win those little races get my stick of gum Loved it. And skate. I love the skateboard too. Uh, ask me now, probably would die. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. These are, these are all the, well, when I was 10, <laughs> I would exactly. do that yeah. today. Don't even think about it. Uh, Lucy, uh, Lucy B. How about you? Skates or blades? Do you have a preference? Oh, yeah, so this is horrifying. Um, my wife and I got rollerblades like near the beginning of the pandemic, because I thought it would be very fun to have like a Friday night skate date. Um, so I was like practicing on mine immediately got injured, like first time out, got hurt. So I'm going to have to probably say roller skates because roller blades were a bad idea. Um, and then I think skateboarding, I would love to learn how to skateboard. Maybe I can get uh, Lucy dreamer to teach me how to do that. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Hey, it's about to be an Olympic sport. You know, I think, I think skateboarding is going to, going to pick up in some popularity <laughs> yeah. again. Um, so, uh, Bar Barbara, uh, kind of, kind of, um, started this, so I'm going to, I'm going to continue and I'm going to open it up to our authors. Do you all have questions for each other? I'm putting you on the spot. I realize that. And if you don't, it's perfectly fine, but do you have questions for each other about, uh, writing favorite games? sacred pets um i have one for bryce about the adventurers so um kendall and julia like you know put all of these ideas for adventures in the jar how did you come up with all of those and like are any of them from like real life experience um super hard question thanks Luz. um i mainly just had ideas for scenes that I wanted them to go through or um, like growth experiences and then uh, made the uh, adventures around that. Um, but the the uh, sex toy shop one came really naturally. I just envisioned Joey being pummeled by all these dildos. Um, so, you know, sometimes these things just come to you. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I think we've all imagined that happening to Joey. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Questions for the other panelists? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Can no? I ask Barbara a question? Go for it. Barbara, I'm, when you held up your book, it's quite thick. And I'm wondering if, if you're writing sort of an epic like that, how much time do you spend world building do you do that before you start to write or do the characters come to you and then the world kind of builds itself around them? What's your process? Um, I Well, I, I usually start with characters, but for world building, I, I start it pretty quickly after the characters are in there because I want to know the limitations, you know, of the world and what exactly we can do. And it usually takes me quite a while to write a fantasy from scratch is about nine months to a year because I've got to figure out everything, you know, what type of animals there are, what type of uh, climate they have, all of that kind of thing. And I like everything to make sense. So I don't like to have like an animal that usually lives in a desert suddenly appear in the woods sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it's quite, quite a while, um, but, but I really enjoy it. I wouldn't do anything else. Thank you. And then to kind of build on that, um, Barbara, does that, do you also, does like, does research um, go into that? Like you say, like, what's the climate and blah, blah, blah. Do you do research like, okay, what is their climate going to be like? Is it going to be a perfect, happy climate? Or is it one that's been devastated by something? Or, you know, do, do, you, do you end up doing a lot of research? I do. I do a lot of research, especially if I'm, if I'm doing like an alien planet, then I really do have to start from nothing, right? And make up animals and that sort of thing. And uh, 
then I'm like, you know, okay, I need something with really big claws. So it's always, you know, Google what animal has big claws, <laughs> but then you can go down a hole with like, oh, I mean, now I know all this interesting facts about bears that I can never, ever use. Um, so that's the pitfall of it. But yes, you, you do have to, to research quite a bit, but luckily I don't research things until I need them. So I'm not spending hours and hours and hours researching for nothing, except when sure. I you know, read something about bears. <laughs> well, you know, stuff about bears is always important and interesting. So, okay. Well, you know what? We're, we're right about that time. So again, in the interest of not taking up um, your entire day so that you can go about your happy lives. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for taking the time out to be here today. Really appreciate it. Um, extra shout out to Kate who got up at an ungodly hour to do this. Um, so well done to you. Um, and again, congratulations on being Goldie finalists. That's most excellent. Yay team. So I hope that everybody um, in the audience will take advantage and buy those books. I put the links in there just so you can buy the book. So please do. Um, and I hope that you'll all check out our website and check out the conference and join us at the conference. There should be some, some great things. I mean, my gosh, we're going to have Emma Donahue there talking about her, her latest book. So that's kind of awesome. Um, so take time, check us out. Hopefully you'll join us at the conference at minimum, the Goldie Awards. Uh, so Thank you all very much. We're off next week. No spotlights next week. GCLS Book Club is on next weekend, but we will return June 12th. So go sign up for those two. Thank you, everybody. Have a great, great day and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks so much. Bye-bye now. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.